Amen. Thank you. As I say, I know the Lord is honored tonight as you sing His praises and have blessed us, His people, in leading us in worship. Uh, it's good to be back with you again tonight. Thank you, uh, Brother Benny, for the invitation to be here this week. And uh, I tell you, the more I get to know you, Pastor, of course, I've known him a long time, but uh, the more I spend time with him, uh, the more I appreciate him as one who loves the Lord's church, one who loves the Lord's people. He's a shepherd through and through. And that's the calling to be a pastor. You know, the Bible uses the, uh, the image of a shepherd, one who, who cares for the sheep when it describes to us uh, uh, what a pastor is supposed to be and what a pastor is called to do. Uh, I see that in your pastor, and I thank the Lord for it. Uh, we... We need more pastors like him across this state and across this country. And, and I trust that as uh, you serve hand in hand with uh, Brother Benny and, and, and his bride and, and one another, that the Lord will continue to use you and, and uh, bless you for his glory and for the sake of his gospel as you share that gospel. I've been sharing some little highlights with you uh, throughout uh, the course of the week about uh, ways that you are serving the Lord even beyond what you see evident right here in this community. And, and one of the things that I want to be sure you're aware of regarding the mission work that you're doing in cooperation with 2400 Kentucky Baptist Convention churches is what you're doing to reach the next generation uh, on the college and university campuses. There's about a quarter of a million students uh, who are college and uh, university students uh, on our campuses uh, across the state. Now, uh, Tom Rainer did some research a few years ago regarding the generation that, uh, that is uh, of that high school and college age. And according to uh, the research that uh, Dr. Rainer and his uh, team conducted, it was concluded that somewhere between 4 and 6% of those who are now college and university age if you were to ask them, are you a born-again follower of the Lord Jesus, somewhere between 4 and 6% would say, yes, I'm a born-again follower of the Lord Jesus. And that means that somewhere between 94 and 96% uh, either wouldn't have a clue what you meant by that question, or if they did, they would not be able to definitely say, yes, I have been born again. And I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if they were to die right now, they would spend eternity separated from God in hell. And that's why Kentucky Baptists work together to place campus missionaries on the college and university campuses across the state. We have 10 of them now. There are over 100 campuses uh, we think of UK and U of L and our favorite ball teams and e EKU and, of course, uh, being right here on the doorstep of the University of, of the Cumberlands. But actually, there are over 100 campuses, uh, college and university campuses across the state. Uh, we have 10 full-time uh, men who serve as missionaries on those campuses. They're designated full-time to a particular campus, uh, but we've been encouraging them to do all they can to encourage churches in the locations and the areas of those other campuses to get engaged, to get involved, to begin to do what they can to evangelize uh, those campuses. We've seen uh, good results. In fact, when I first came into my role, uh, what was it, 2011, I think, brother, it, it goes so fast. <laughs> when I first came in my role, 2011, uh, I asked the Baptist campus ministers at that time, how, how many have professed faith in Christ under your ministry? And statewide, uh, they gave me a total of 96 professions of faith statewide. Uh, that wasn't necessarily uh, individuals who have been baptized or joined a church. That was just who, who's prayed to put their trust in Christ under your ministry. Well, we've challenged them uh, to work harder and do better and, and, and to get more, more churches involved in the work on those campuses. And I'll have you know uh, that this past year there were over 1,000 professions of faith under the ministry of those, your campus missionaries on the college and university. Why do I call them yours? You're paying for their salaries. This cooperative program supports those missionaries. 
And so that's something as Faith Baptist thinks about the work that God is doing through this congregation. Uh, you can realize that, hey, you're helping evangelize the students, the next generation on our college and university campus. Now, it's also important to know uh, that I think, uh, and I, I didn't look this up before I came in, but the best I remember is about 8,000 students uh, on our college and university campus who are from overseas. And they come here to get an education. And so uh, you, you, uh, you're winning the nations to Christ, even on the college and university campuses through those missionaries. I thank God for you and for your commitment. We're going to be looking tonight at a passage of Scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Uh, we've, we've talked about the urgency of these days, and the urgency of the gospel in light of the promised return of Jesus. Uh, we've talked about our need to get ourselves right with the Lord as we get right with one another and seeking revival by being willing not only to receive forgiveness but to extend forgiveness. We've talked about the centrality of, of, of Jesus and, and our need to walk closely with the Lord Jesus, to give Him His rightful place in our lives. Now tonight I want to take this sort of the next step along the way as we, as we seek revival from the Lord. And I want us to think, as we reflect upon the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want us to think about what it means for our lives uh, to be used of God, uh, not just for personal revival, but to promote revival in the Lord's church and, and awakening among the lost. How could God use your life? How could God use my life? And Paul focuses in, I think, on that message in 2 Corinthians 4. Let me read the first verse, and then you keep it marked because we're going to look at a lot of uh, other verses as we continue along. But, but Paul says this, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We faint not. Uh, as Brother Benny mentioned, I do a lot of traveling across uh, uh, the state of Kentucky, and, and uh, sometimes uh, those travels can, as those of you who travel uh, know, it, it, it can leave you a little tired, but, but we don't faint in our work. And as I have traveled across this state uh, over the course of the last few years when I've been serving this role, I tell you, I, I have come uh, more and more to love the people called Kentucky Baptists. Uh, we, have a, we have a wonderful state. It's a beautiful state to drive across. And, and uh, what makes it uh, so beautiful are the people, and particularly it's God's people, uh, that I enjoy uh, getting to know and, and uh, seeing how God is using them. As I think about people from Kentucky, I, I, I was reminded of a letter that, uh, that uh, I had run across some time back. Uh, this letter is from a soldier uh, riding home to a uh, Kentucky soldier riding home uh, to Ma and Pa. I, I want to share that letter with you. You, you. you listen along with me. Dear Ma and Pa, I, I'm doing real good here in the Army. I hope you are too. Uh, tell Brother Walt and Brother Elmer that the Army beats working on the farm for old man Mitch by a mile. Uh, tell them they ought to join up real quick before all the places get filled up. says, I, I was restless at first because you get to stay in bed till nearly 6 a.m. But I'm getting so as I like to sleep late. <laughs> you tell Walt and Elmer all you got to do before breakfast is smooth the cot out and shine a few things. There's no hogs to slop, no cows to milk, uh, no hay to pitch, no wood to split, no fire to start. Practically nothing going on in the mornings around this place. Uh, now, now, when you make it to breakfast, you've you got to realize that breakfast is strong on the trimmings like juice and cereal and fruit, but it's, it's kind of weak on chops and taters and grits and biscuits and other regular food. But you tell Walt and Elmer that they not, not worry about that if they join the Army because they can always sit by those two city boys that live on coffee. Uh, their food plus yours will hold you till you get fed again. Now it's no wonder those city boys can't walk much. We, we go on these route marches, which the platoon sergeant says are long walks to hardness. If he thinks so, it's not my place to tell him different, but a route march, a route, uh, march is about as far as to the mailbox back home. And it seems like then those city boys get uh, sore feet and we all end up riding back in trucks. Now the next thing is going to kill Walt and Elmer with laughing. I, I, I'm getting medals for shooting. I don't know why. The bull's, head, the bull's eye is, is near as big as a rattler's head and it ain't even moving. 
It ain't shooting back at you like the Higgett boys back home. <laughs> All you got to do is lie there real comfortable and hit it. Uh, then we got this thing called hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Now, that's where you get to wrestle them city boys. But you got to be careful because I found they break real easy. <laughs> This ain't nothing like fighting that old bull back home. I'm about the best they've got at this, except for uh, that Tug Jordan from over at Cane Creek. Uh, now, I only beat him once, but you've got to remember, I'm 5'6", 130 pounds, and he's six foot eight, nearly 300 pounds. Uh, but you be sure and tell Walton Elmer that, that they ought to hurry up and join on before other fellers catch on to this and come stampeding in and take up all the spots. I'll ride again when I can. Your loving daughter, Alice. <laughs> now, we make them tough in Kentucky, don't we? Uh, faint not. How tough are you? Uh, not just because uh, you're from Kentucky, if you are. Not just because you're a Kentucky Baptist. And if you're a member of this church, you are. Uh, but as... You have answered the call of God in your life to be a follower of Jesus and then been called to do His work here on earth. I know in the times in which we live, it'd be easy to feel a little faint, wouldn't it? We think about what's going on in our culture. We think about what's going on in this country. Uh, we think about what's going on right here in the commonwealth. Uh, clerks being thrown in jail. Our own constitution being scrapped, as we think about the challenges to religious freedom, as we think about uh, the drug problem, as we think about uh, the lostness, the growing lostness in this state, as, as, as we think about all that is happening around us, it'd be easy to feel a little faint. But I want to encourage you tonight to remember those who have gone before you and how Instead of fainting, they finished, and they finished well. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians is going through a time in his life and ministry that is incredibly challenging, and we see that here in his passage. Paul also knows that the church is going through a time that is incredibly difficult and incredibly challenging, but Paul is encouraging the church Corinth, the same way that I think God wants to encourage uh, the church at Corbin. He's encouraging the church to press on through the hardships and difficulties. Continue to serve faithfully the Lord Jesus. Pay whatever price you have to pay. You keep following Him. You keep obeying Him. You keep living a life that He can use in this broken and sinful and lost and dying world. What would it look like for you and I to live lives that the Lord could use? That, that our lives will get, give evidence to, to, the, to the fact that God loves the world. That our lives will give evidence to the fact that Jesus is the Savior of the world. That our lives will give evidence to the very truth of the gospel. Well, that's what I want us to focus in on tonight. There's an image that Paul uses in this chapter. And I want us to sort of capture that and use it uh, as an example. Uh, we find Paul referencing it in verse 7. And so we're going to read verse 7 and we're going to back back up to where we were. But I want us to get this image in mind. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Some translations say jars of clay. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul says we have the treasure of Christ uh, in, in earthen vessels or jars of clay. Now he's talking about us, our, our mortal bodies. We have the treasure of Christ for the world to see through us. What would it take for the world to be able to see Christ in you? And in me. Well, there's some lessons tonight uh, that Paul's going to teach us. Uh, lessons, we'll call it, from a clay jar. Look with me again. Beginning at the beginning of the chapter, Paul's encouraged us not to faint. And then in verse 2, he says this. 
We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Thinking about that image of a, of a clay jar or a clay pot, I, I, I think what Paul is saying here is that, that we ought to keep the lid off. When you, when you think about your life, you ought to keep the... De- Paul says we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not walking in craftiness. We're not handling the Word of God deceitfully. He's saying that, that we are living a life that if people observe our lives, that if they look at our lives, that there ought not to be anything hidden or anything that would bring uh, disrepute on the Gospel or on the Lord Jesus Himself. But we ought to live our lives open and we ought to live our lives authentically. So that if others are able to look at our lives, or if they were even even able to peer into our hearts or into our minds, that what they would see, what they would hear, what they would observe, would not be inconsistent with the testimony that we have given, with the profession that we have made, that Jesus is Lord of our lives. Now to sort of illustrate this, I, I brought a clay pot. One of the things that you'll notice as you look at uh, my little clay pot that I've brought this evening is that there's no lid on it. Uh, You look in it, you can see whatever's in it. Now, if you're looking in it, you can see there's nothing in it. (laughs) But if there was something in it, you could see it. As the world looks at the lives of those who claim to be followers of Jesus, you know, there's nothing the world likes more or the devil likes more than to find something in the lives of those who claim to be followers of Jesus that would discredit our claim, that would make of us uh, undisputable hypocrites who claim one thing, preach one thing, teach one thing, but live an entirely different thing. Now Paul is encouraging us. Don't, don't, don't give the devil that disclaimer on the Christian faith. Don't, don't give him that stick that he can beat you over the head with and seek to discredit Jesus himself and his gospel with. Let, let, let your life be open and, and visible that that your testimony, not, not, not walking about in dishonesty or craftiness, but, but seek to live a life of purity and authenticity before a watching world and before the Lord. Uh, let, let your public life and your private life be the same, be consistent. Don't, don't be caught doing away from the church family what you wouldn't do when you were with the church family. As others consider our behavior, let's not show them inconsistent. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. None of us are. But there is a a huge difference between the one who is striving to obey Christ and who slips and falls and is caught by the grace of Christ. There's a huge difference between that and the one who would preach one thing but consistently live out something very different. And so let us be consistent. Let us be able to commend ourselves to every man's conscience. There's so many things that are going on in the world right now. I have the vantage point as, as, as I work with so many churches and so many pastors to see so many falling. So many falling. Falling into immorality, falling uh, into broken marriages, falling into sin in such a way that not only is that ministry wrecked, but the church of the Lord Jesus is wounded and the testimony of the gospel is damaged. Let Let us rise up and strive to honor the Lord every moment and every day, and even even when we think no one is looking. Is it 30 million names? 
30 million who thought they were acting in secret. But the Bible says what is whispered in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. The Bible says be sure your sin will find you out. And so the Ashley Madison list and the fallout from that is, is beyond... I think what any of us appreciates at this moment, we've already had one seminary professor and pastor take his life last week because of the shame and the embarrassment that he had brought to himself and to his family and to the Lord's work. He just could not apparently even live with it. What a tragedy. A tragedy that he fell into such sin and then a tragedy that he found himself uh, so hopeless that he he couldn't, in, in, in repentance, turn to Christ and, 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 and live with the consequences of his sin. And he chose instead to end his life. How tragic. Brothers and sisters, let us be encouragers one of another. Any of us could be there in a moment. We all have our weak spots, our, our points at which we are tempted. It, 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 it may be like unto that. It may be something entirely different. But we must guard our hearts. And we must stand watch over one another as encouragers that the ministry of the Lord Jesus would be carried out and our lives would reflect upon the glorious gospel of Jesus. Keep the lid off. Then uh, Paul encourages us to keep it full. Keep your life full. Keep it full of what? Keep it full of the treasure. Keep it full of the Lord Jesus Himself. Paul goes on, I want to pick up now in verse 5. If you're following along with me, Paul says, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. What is the treasure? Well, Paul has said what the treasure is. We're not preaching ourselves. We're preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. He's the treasure. There's another place that Paul put it like this. He said, I, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And who gave himself up for me. If you have that treasure in your life. If you've repented of your sin. And put your trust in Jesus as your savior. You need to be letting that treasure show. And, and, and keep your life filled with that treasure. By walking closer with Christ. By, uh, by spending time in prayer and in his word. And seeking to allow him uh, to use you. Now honestly there's not much much about me that is of any value to the kingdom of God. I don't have much to offer. I don't, I don't bring much. I just think about my physical body. You know, someone did a study one time about the worth of a human body. Now, apparently, a human body is worth more than we thought it was. Because some people are getting rich selling the body parts of little babies. The horror of that, a new video was released today. I don't know if you've watched them. Most of us think, well, I wouldn't want to watch that. But I, I personally believe we need to watch that. We need to know what's really going on in the murder, the slaughter and sale of babies in this country. 3,000 aborted every single day in this country. I, I can't even get my mind around the horror. But apart from what a, a child's body parts are worth on the black market, so, so someone did a study. If you were to break the human body down in just the components uh, uh, that it's made out of, you know, the human body is made mostly of water. Uh, the highest percentage of any ingredient is water. Uh, beyond that, uh, there is uh, phosphorus and there is calcium, there's nitrogen, a little carbon, most of that can be found in the dirt. <laughs> so it kind of goes back to the way the Lord made us, right? He, 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 he made us from the dirt. If you broke all that down and, and, and determined its value, it's been estimated that it's worth about five bucks. The human body has 
has about five dollars worth of materials in it. So there's not really much. This 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 clay pot is worth just about that much. You know how much, that's, that's, a, that's a Walmart purchase right there. You know how much that thing's tagged for? Buck thirteen. Dollar thirteen. That's not worth much. You know what's made out? About the same thing you're made out of. <laughs> it's made out of dirt and water. A special kind of dirt, clay. And it's hardened, you know, the process. But it's, it's really not worth all that much. Priced at Walmart for $1.13. But now if I were to put something in that little clay pot, I've got here a, a Ben Franklin. $100 bill. I'm going to drop it in my pot. Now, what's that pot worth? Now, you got to remember, I'm a preacher. Preachers don't do math well. So you got to help me. What's that pot worth now? 101.13. We, we might have a school teacher out there somewhere. $101.13. Why? Well, because my jar's got a treasure in it. so do you and so do I if we're in Christ there's a treasure Paul says that you're carrying around this treasure in an earthen vessel but that's okay there's a reason for that that the excellencies of God the, 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 the glorious love of God in his gospel where he sent his son into the world to redeem us to save us to indwell us by the power of his spirit that whatever we do, the evidence might be that it's being done by God Himself as He uses it. I don't have much to offer, but the Lord has given a treasure. And He's willing to use you. And He's desiring to use me. We need to keep our lives full of the treasure. We need to keep the lid off. But there's a final lesson that I want to point you to as we think about how God could use our lives to not only enjoy revival, but to promote revival in the lives of others. It's this. You keep it when it's broken. You keep it when it's broken. Notice what Paul says as we continue on reading, picking up now in verse 8. Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, but then he confesses we're, we're troubled on every side, verse 8 yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul was going through a hard time. And he was low. In fact, there's one place where Paul said, we, we longed for death. That's how hard it was. Paul says there's a purpose in that. That in our dying, the life of Jesus might be shown. In our brokenness and in our pain, anything that would be accomplished through us, everyone would be able to look and know that God has done it. God is at work. God has done something beautiful. I told you Buck 13 was on my pot. And it is. But actually this pot is on sale. You don't find too many things at Walmart on sale. <laughs> but this is on sale. Uh, up at the above uh, dollar thirteen on my sticker it says 75 cents. 75 cents. Now, because I'm a bargain shopper, as soon as I saw a clay pot at Walmart for 75 cents, I grabbed it. But then I realized why it was marked 75 cents. If you were to look closely at this pot, maybe you can't see it from where you are, but actually right here, there's a crack running down the side of that pot. And there's another crack right here, and there's a chip knocked out of it right here, and a crack, and a crack right there. Matter of fact, this is a cracked pot. <laughs> kind of like me sometimes, a crack pot.
But I still believe you could grow a flower in that pot. A tomato plant. Or have a treasure in it. Paul says, uh, church is rough. It's tough. Uh, we're, we're troubled. We're perplexed. We are being persecuted. We are, we are cast down. But we're not distressed. And we're not in despair. And we're not forsaken. And we are not destroyed. Church, I, I submit to you that our time is now re-entering the time of the Apostle Paul. The time in which we live is now hearkening back to the days of the Apostle Paul where more and more the church is going to find trouble on every side. And we're going to be perplexed as we look at this lost and dying and broken world and all that's taking place around us. We're going to endure persecution. Our brothers and sisters overseas, they know what that really looks like and what it really feels like. And while we just had a little bitty bitty taste of it, I, I, I'm afraid that eventually in this country we're going to really know what it looks like and what it really feels like. We're going to be cast down. But bless God. We have nothing to fear. Bless God. We know there's a victory that awaits us. Bless God. We have a hope that carries us even as we face death. We have a hope that carries us beyond the grave. And so let us not be distressed even when we're troubled. Let us not be in despair even if we're perplexed. Let us not feel forsaken because we're not even in the midst of persecution. Let us understand that we will not be destroyed even if we be cast down. Why? Because the life of Jesus is in us. It's in us. And so if you feel a little broken, join the club. We're all broken. I'm broken. And you're broken. We're all broken. But that's okay. The Lord continues to use us anyway. The poet described it like this. Pain knocked upon my door and said that she'd come to stay. And though I would not welcome her, I bade her go away. She entered in. And like my own shade, she followed after me. From her stabbing, stinging sword, oh, not a moment was I free. Then one day another knocked gently at my door. I said, no, pain is here. There isn't room for more. Then I heard his gentle voice. Tis I, be not afraid. From the moment he entered in, oh, the difference he made. a Savior who loves you. And you may feel the sting of pain in your body right now, in your heart right now. You may feel a lot of pain because of the circumstances of your life right now. But there's one who wants to enter in and to make a difference. Not just in you, but through you. you see, God uses even the pain and that's what Paul's saying. God uses even the pain. Even in our dying, it is for the sake that the life of Jesus will be made known to this world. God uses even the pain in our lives to show Himself and His gospel to the world. Don't forget that, especially when it's hurting. <laughs> when I was a boy growing up, one of my favorite pastimes when we were down on the creek, was rock skipping. Any rock skippers out there? I, I'm a rock skipper from way back. We uh, used to spend, my aunt lived down on uh, uh, the Clear Fork, and, and uh, we'd, we'd go uh, to her house a lot, and uh, fish a while, and then it'd get hot, and then we'd go to skipping rocks. Just across the creek from where we were always playing and fishing and skipping rocks, there was a railroad track. This railroad track uh, there in the mountains along the creek side was, was actually built on a bed of gravel, uh, the, the big rocks about as big as your fist, where it had been built up to, to stay above the flooding of the creek and, and, and to get uh, across the dips and the hills and the hollers 
In fact, right there where we played, that, that, that bed of rock was probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 feet deep, and a railroad track built across the top of it. Now, I don't know how many, there, how many rocks there were in that rock bed, but, uh, but I'd say there was at least a few million, maybe a few billion. There was a whole lot of rocks there. But when we were skipping rocks, we never crossed the creek. Even though there were millions, maybe billions of rocks there on the other side of the creek, we never crossed the creek and got those rocks. Why not? Well, you ever try to skip a rock like that? <laughs> it goes kaplunk, splash. It doesn't skip. Now, if you want to skip a rock, what you do is you reach down in the creek to, to the creek bed, and, and there you'll find a good, smooth, flat stone. It's been made smooth by the water flowing across it for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. That water's rounded and rocked the net, rough, knocked the rough edges off of it and, and flattened it down. And, and boy, you can find the finest skipping rocks in the bottom of that creek that you'd ever want to find. You know, there's been a lot of rough edges on Paul Chitwood. That over the years, the Lord's had to knock off, smooth them down in order to be able to use me. And I've found that more often than not, the Lord knocking off those rough edges was painful. And sometimes it hurt really bad. But the pain was always for a purpose. The Lord was getting me ready to be used. Even the pain has a purpose. So if you feel a little broken, oh, don't be in despair. Don't think God can't use you or God doesn't want to. In fact, the Lord might use that pain to show His goodness to those around you. Because the one who continues to be faithful to the Lord, even in the midst of pain, well, that's the one who has a testimony. You see, so many, when they're tested by pain, they, they just sort of disappear. They decide, well, it, it apparently it wasn't real. Or maybe God doesn't love me. Or, 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 or God wouldn't do that if, if, if He was really the kind of God that the Bible says He is. And, and a little pain is all it takes for them to give up on God and, and just sort of vanish. But those whom the Lord could use greatly, the Lord often hurts deeply. And those who stand and testify to the goodness of God and the truth of His Word, even in the midst of the pain, they are the ones through whose death the life of Jesus is seen. A clay pot. Doesn't look like much. Mine's broken. <laughs> but Paul says, this earthen vessel, it's a tool in the hand of God. Might we surrender ourselves to his hand and be used for his glory? Let's stand.